Okay, good afternoon, everybody. My name is James Kent, and I am the marketing manager for the MBA program here at CIBS. Um, I, I'm slightly sad that we're not meeting in person today, um, but hopefully in the future I'll have uh, opportunity to meet uh, a lot of you. We have a lot of people online through Zoom, uh, through uh, through WeChat, and also on YouTube. Uh, so it's great to see so many people uh, for this uh, kickoff. MBA exclusive lecture that we're hosting today. Um, so before we get started with the professor's lecture, uh, I would just like to set the scene to really give you some information on why we have the credentials to talk about uh, uh, rethinking marketing for the digital age. Uh, so as a business school here in China, I will introduce to you a little bit about the MBA program uh, and what to expect if you actually come to campus as a student. Then I will hand over the floor uh, to Professor Zhang for her lecture. And then we will close up today by inviting back uh, four of our recent, not so recent actually, uh, alumni uh, that graduated from the full-time MBA program here at CIBS to talk about their experiences, but also to talk about career development uh, also uh, in the digital age. Okay, so let's get started with my introduction. Let's start with the what and why of, you know, why potentially you would uh, look to give up your, your current job uh, and to come and study a full-time MBA. Okay, uh, so I quite like this uh, graph that's shared by our friends at QS. Uh, they're responsible for the MBA tours around the world. And you can see really the, the kind of the big uptick or the increase in trajectory uh, of people in terms of their salary when they do a, an MBA program, right? Compared to with an MBA versus without an, an MBA. Uh, I am sadly on the, the blue line, but hopefully many of you in the audience in the future will be rocketing through for the, uh, for the red line. So that's essentially why you'd look to, to do uh, an MBA. But there are many schools around the world, right, that you can then pursue this, uh, few, you know, further studies. So I'm here to talk about China Europe International Business School and why out of all the schools in the world, you know, you might consider us. Uh, so for those who are familiar with the school, you may well know uh, that we're not a Chinese university or business school per se. We're actually one of the longest standing joint ventures between China and Europe. Uh, so the Chinese partner is the Chinese government and the European partner is the European Commission. So through that, we have five campuses around the world, uh, three in China, uh, our European campus on the shores of Lake Zurich uh, in Switzerland. And also, uh, I believe we're one of the only or one of the very few business schools around the world to also have a footprint in Africa with our campus in, uh, in Accra. Uh, so that is essentially the, the makeup of the school. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, we have Professor Zhang Lingling talking to us today about marketing, uh, but she's only one of the, the many professors, you know, nearly 80 full-time professors that we have here at CEIBS, okay, with a very international percentage of, of faculty that, that come here because really it's the most exciting place for our generation to, to be. Okay. And they don't just bring their, their international knowledge from doing their PhDs overseas. Uh, they also come here and they do research with local Chinese companies and also multinational companies uh, operating in China. Uh, and through that, many of you may already be familiar with the case study method, which is very popular for teaching at, uh, at business schools. And indeed, if you come to SEEBS, you'll have a lot of cases to read. But we also have our own homegrown case center that produces uh, over 2,000 cases. Uh, about Chinese companies that are going global or multinational companies making a big splash in China to really give you kind of an understanding of what makes business tick here, regardless of if you're Chinese or international. Uh, so above those faculty uh, sit three very important <clears throat> gentlemen. Uh, so we have two former French Prime Ministers, uh, Jean-Pierre Raffarin and Dominique de Villepin, uh, that uh, are distinguished faculty, uh, as well as uh, Pascal Lamy, uh, who used to be the Director General of the World Trade Organization. Um, and they represent the school. They also come to campus uh, to teach and also have time with uh, the MBA students. So hopefully you'll see them walking around campus at some point in the future. Uh, so that's the school of the whole. Now, if we really kind of drill down into the MBA program, as I mentioned, it's a full-time program. Uh, it takes place between 12 to 16 months uh, on campus. Uh, that also includes the chance to uh, break away from campus, go on exchange, do projects that I'm also going to get into in a little bit of the time. Uh, we're also extremely highly ranked that you can see uh, sort of three from this list, as well as being accredited by the, the main bodies that, that regulate business 
schools and MBA programs uh, around the world. Uh, in fact, obviously, you can see here we are number one in Asia uh, with uh, Forbes and the Financial Times, a position that we've held for, for a long time now. Uh, so if you did come, who would you be coming here with? Well, typically uh, we recruit uh, around 150 students each year. Uh, this infographic that you can see here, this is kind of the average from the last uh, few years at CIBS. Uh, in fact, that female student percentage uh, went over 50% uh, for the current class for the first time, something that we're very proud of, um, but also extremely international. You can see here by the, the international student ratio, uh, but also even the Chinese students, you know, a lot of them now have studied overseas or worked overseas and are coming back. And the thing that really ties a lot of SEEP students together is that our students really want to play that bridge role between China and the world or China and Europe, okay? Uh, so if you're interested in China, but also want a very international career, uh, then SEEPS is the right place to come. Uh, I'll just talk briefly about the curriculum. We can really break this down into, into three, uh, three parts of the program. Uh, so you start the program and as a top tier MBA program, a lot of the, 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 the MBAs around the world are fairly similar. Everybody will do the core modules. So you'll do marketing core, you'll do a leadership journey, you'll do economics, accounting, et cetera, et cetera. This is where it's going to be very in intense on the, the kind of rigorous academic side. Um, but the middle part of the program, that's where we maybe differ from a lot of other business schools around the world, because this is where it really changes gear. OK, and you're taking that core knowledge and really applying it to new situations. Uh, so during this time, there's the opportunity to do an internship uh, during the summer. We have this uh, integrated China strategy project that I'll, I'll mention about shortly. Uh, and we also at this time have the opportunity for you to, to really kind of drill down into nearly 40 different electives that you can choose from. So it's really the middle part of the journey that you're really kind of honing what you'd like to do after the MBA and using SEEB's extensive network and resources to really propel your career into the direction that you're, you're looking for. Uh, this culminates in a, an uh, overseas exchange opportunity for two to three months uh, that I will also explain a little bit more about. And then the final third of the program really depends on what you're looking to do after. OK, if you're going back to a family business, then that's obviously fine. You can just finish your credits. Uh, if you're starting your own business, which would be very exciting. Uh, this is when a lot of time you'll have, you know, kind of fewer electives, fewer courses that you can really spend time dedicated uh, to getting your business off the ground through our e-lab. Um, but for a lot of people, if you're looking to kind of find that next job after after the MBA uh, through some of the resources it receives. This is where a lot of the time is focused on really kind of uh, putting yourself in front of potential employers, uh, also doing informational coffee chats with them. Uh, and I'll explain a little bit about how SEEDS will help you on that journey at the, at the end of the presentation. Okay, uh, so I mentioned kind of in the middle of the program, there's this opportunity to kind of to break away from campus and we have a beautiful uh, campus here in Shanghai, um, but essentially, you know, for a school that prides itself on, uh, on delivering a program between China and the world, we have to take you to other parts of, uh, of the country that have been responsible for its success. So we go to the Gobi Desert to do a, a leadership uh, in action uh, elective that's, that's very exciting. It's a lot of hard work. It's very, very hot, um, but it's certainly essential for people that are looking to uh, upskill in terms of their leadership skills. Uh, we also have the opportunity, COVID uh, permitting, and hopefully it will start getting back to this soon to do some of the overseas elective at our campuses in Zurich or in, uh, in Ghana, uh, as well as working with some of our partners in other parts of the, the world to send students on short one week uh, overseas modules uh, that are there. Um, I also mentioned this briefly, we have this uh, fantastic opportunity, the Integrated China Strategy Project for MBAs uh, to work in a compulsory project, uh, a live consulting project with some fantastic big names in the industry here. And this is great if you really want to pivot or move your career into a new direction. You might be excited to work for one of these companies and really understand, you know, what are some of the strategic challenges that they're facing. Well, it seems through the ICSP, it really gives you that chance to be in that a strategic consultant role uh, and to really help add value uh, to what these uh, these companies are delivering in the China market. I mentioned as well, uh, we have some fantastic exchange partners. I won't read all of them out, but you can see them here. So big names like INSEAD, Wharton, London Business School, HEC Paris, uh, NYU Stern. Uh, so fantastic. If you wanted to then kind of spend uh, time at SEEVES, but also gain more on the international side. Uh, as well as that, 
Uh, we also partner with, uh, with two top tier institutions in the US uh, to offer uh, dual degree programs. And if you'd like any information on this, then I'm happy to, to give it later on in the, uh, in the event today. Okay, as I wrap up my presentation, you know, one thing that sadly uh, you maybe won't get a, a feeling for online, but we will kind of get to talk about during the, uh, the MBA alumni panel is that, you know, really it's not just about the, the academics with an MBA, it's really about building your network and, and leveraging SEEP's community. And there are many ways that we can do that, but one is to, to really kind of look at what goes on outside of the, the, the walls of, uh, of uh, the classroom uh, and really kind of partner with some of Seems fantastic resources uh, to, to put on club events or to put on large scale activities on campus, for example, TEDx Seems or, or Innovate China. Okay, uh, I mentioned just quickly as well, the, uh, the different types of companies that we work with for the ICSP. Well, a lot of these companies and more, they also come back and they partner with SEEDS because they look to recruit talent from here. So we have a dedicated career development center uh, that have consultants that focus on different industry verticals that can really help you to build your resume during the 12 to 16 month program to really appeal and stand out in the eyes of these companies, okay? And that's one of the best ways to look at the MBA journey. It is that rebuilding and retooling your CV to make yourself competitive in the post MBA career that you're looking to, to land. Um, the eLab, I won't go into too many details today, but if you are looking to start your own business or propel your own business, then we offer a fantastic uh, space on, on campus uh, here. Uh, and then finally, if all that sounds good and hopefully you enjoy uh, the lecture today uh, and then also uh, meeting our alumni uh, afterwards, uh, then I'll just share briefly about the application process. So in order to apply, uh, you need to apply with a full application before one of the four uh, deadlines listed uh, on, the, on the screen here. And then to apply, you do everything online. You write three essays, you ask for two letters of recommendations from uh, previous employers. Uh, you need to have a minimum of two years work experience and a bachelor's degree. Uh, and then you also need the, the GMAT score or GRE. And in addition to GMAT or GRE, we also have our own uh, on-campus uh, test that we can share a little bit about uh, later on in the presentation. And then as it normally comes up and it's a popular question, uh, yes, we do offer scholarship and financial aid. Uh, typically about one third of the students receive a uh, scholarship, either diversity based or, or merit based. And we have uh, a plethora of other uh, funding options available for students that are, that are interested in um, having some additional means to help them to, uh, to afford their, their studies here. Okay, so that's my part of the, of the presentation, I think delivered in, in record time. Uh, so thanks very much for listening to me. Um, before I introduce the professor, I would just like to share that if you have any questions throughout, either about the MBA program or about the content that Professor Jang will talk about, then please put any, any questions in the chat box, uh, not the Q&A, if you put it in the, in the chat box, uh, and then we will try to get through as many of those questions uh, as we can uh, throughout, or, or most likely at the end of the, uh, the, the presentation. Uh, by Professor Jang. Okay, um, so without further ado, uh, Professor Jang, uh, who's sat in the room with me now, it's a, a delight to have her share the stage uh, today to, to give us this, uh, this keynote presentation on rethinking products and services in the, in the digital age. Uh, we're very excited to, 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 to have her here. She teaches the, 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 some of the core electives for, uh, for marketing here at SEEBS, uh, but previously uh, she was in the US uh, where she did her DBA uh, in, in marketing, sorry, DBA from Harvard Business School. Uh, and then she worked at the Robert H. Smith uh, School of Business where she was at uh, University of Maryland where she was assistant professor of marketing. Uh, her research areas, for those of you that are interested, uh, is about consumer insights from, from AI, uh, but also platform competition and digital marketing. Uh, so it's a delight that we have her today. Uh, I'm going to turn off my camera and hand over the floor uh, to Professor Jan. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy.
Thank you so much for the introduction, James. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to the uh, e exclusive lecture uh, hosted by CEIBS MBA program. So my name is Lin Ling Zhang. I'm assistant professor in the marketing department. It is my great pleasure to share the topic of rethinking products and the services in the digital age. So before I start the lecture of today, so I want to first talk about the teaching philosophy in SIEBS classrooms, okay? So the faculty here at SIEBS really see ourselves as the hub connecting three bodies of knowledge. So first is the classic business theories along with the latest developments. And second, we keep track of the best practices and of course, right, so the new trends and challenges that are happening in China and overseas. So the faculty sees it as our responsibilities to bring the theory and practice to meet the student learning in the classroom. So we'll make the learning interactive and then we'll make it theoretically rigorous and practically relevant. Our goal is that the MBA graduates will enter the business world with a clearer mind and better confidence, right? To make the world a better place. So with that in mind, so I want to achieve three learning objectives for today. So first, I want to offer a glimpse into digital transformations of business and the consumer behavior. Okay. I'm gonna do this by talking about two examples and you will see two different businesses that make the transition from the product centric point of view to the consumer centric point of view. And by looking at these examples, you will have a better understanding of the underlying logics of why some of the product strategies look different in today's technology intensive environment. And as James mentioned, right? So if you have any questions, please uh, type the questions and uh, the comments in the chat, and I will hope to get to them by the end of the lecture. Okay. So I'm gonna start the lecture by posing this very famous question. So this question was, uh, was asked by the Harvard Business School professor, Theodore Levitt in 1960. So every person in the business world got to ask this question multiple times. What business are you in? Typically, we encounter two types of answers, right? So you will hear people define their business by the products they're, they're making. So you will hear something like, oh, we're making smartwatches, or we're in the banking industry. Well, if the products and services are hard to describe, for example, in emerging markets, you will hear people define their business as competitors, right, using their competitors. So for example, oh, we're DD, but for business travelers, or we're Airbnb, but for long-term rentals. So this type of product-centric uh, point of view actually lead to the very famous uh, framework, right? So in their classroom. So you tend to start by thinking of your offerings. What am I making? And then you see the market as, a, you know, as the multiple customer segments. And of course, right? So no company wants to serve, can uh, serve the entire market you tend to focus on the target customer segment. So who is my target customer segment? After you find your target customer segment, you say that you find the product and the market fit, right? So you have your offerings, you find the right customer segment who will like your offerings the best. So after you define the fit, you try to come up with the product strategy or the go-to-market strategy. So the strategy will consist of four different components. So first is the product. So what is the, what is the optimal features for the product for the selected target segments? And then you think about what is the optimal price that I should set for my product? And then you think about the place. What will be the place for me to sell the products or the services? And then finally, right, last but not least, what is the promotion strategy? So product, price, place, and the promotion are the famous marketing four Ps, right? So after you have the product and market fit, after you have the marketing four Ps, you define what type of competition you're in. So this framework, right? So 
summarize a large chunk of marketing 101 that you will encounter in the, uh, the core marketing class in all business schools, right? So the framework has been working really well for the past 80 years. However, the world is dynamic. The world is evolving, right? The digital technologies nowadays has really transformed how consumers buy products, use products, and engage with the products. So oftentimes we find that this classic framework is no longer sufficient to tackle all the business and, and all the, the challenges that we encounter in the, in the business world. Okay. So for the remaining time of the lecture, I want to show you two examples. So by doing these examples, we can see how the classic you know, framework can be expanded right, to, to address the new challenges that we encounter. So far so good? Okay. So let's move on to the first example. So the main character of this example is the robotic vacuum cleaner that you see in the bottom left corner of the screen. So the product is called Pure i9. So Pure i9 is a product of electronics, right? So for those of you who are not familiar with the brand, electronics is a company, is a one of the largest home appliance manufacturers in the world. So the base is in Sweden. So electronics is a Fortune 500 company. The business line includes three main categories. So the first category is the appliance of the uh, is the appliance of the home uh, right, taste. So this includes the kitchen appliances, etc. And the second line of business is the care of your clothes. So this product line includes washing machines and dryers. So our main character comes from the third category of the, uh, the product line. So it's the appliances for the well-being at home. So this category uh, includes air purifier, air conditioner, and vacuum cleaner. So Pure i9 is actually one of the most technologically advanced products for electronics, okay? Because, you know, the product really needs to uh, find its charging base, right? So it needs to be able to roam through the room and then have all the area covered. Well, so it carries a lot of hope for the company when it's about to come out four years ago, three, four years ago. Well, there is a lot of reason behind it, behind the excitement. The robotic vacuum cleaner is a relatively new market. So it started around 2015. And if you look at the revenue change, right, so across the world, so the market ex is expanding with a rate of 15 to 20%. And on top of that, the overall penetration of this market is relatively low, meaning that there is a huge potential for this market. So, vacuum, so Pure i9 actually was one of the major products that the company wanted to push out to, to conquer this market. Well, however, right, so the market is also full of competition. Roughly half of the market share goes to the, the brand iRobot, right? And it's an American brand. The second largest player in this market is a Chinese brand, Ecovacs, about 17% of the market share. And the rest of the market, is divided by some other major names, right? Including Xiaomi, Samsung, et cetera. So according to some of their industry report, the competition in this market is throat cutting. So if there is intense competition, you think about the strategy, right? You think about the strategy to develop your competitive advantages. So according to a seminal paper published by Professor Michael Porter, right? So the, uh, the business guru, so he mentioned that the, the strategy for competitive advantages actually comes in two families. So the first strategy is to be cheaper. So do you want to be the lower cost producer in this market? And the second strategy is to be different, right? So you want to differentiate your products from the competitors. Being cheaper will not be the first choice for electronics because the brand image is actually a higher brand, a higher end brand, right? So it's more premium for the rest of the product categories. 
So then the, the only solution left is to be different. But how? If you look at all the competitors in the market, what do you notice? Black and white, right? But you probably notice the shape. Many of the, uh, the ma vast majority of the vacuum cleaners, right, is round. Well, then you may be wondering, uh, can we be different by picking a different shape? And indeed, right, so the most obvious differentiation is the shape. So pure I-9 took the triangular shape. And then the, the, the marketing slogan is, your house isn't round. Why should your vacuum be? By this moment, some of you may be like, really? Can it really be that simple, right? Of course, picking a different shape is a superficial differentiation. Well, I mean, to be fair, right? So the, the, the triangular shape probably will make the vacuum cleaner a little bit easier. <laughs> right, and then, but the question is, right? So with this different shape, even if you are able to cover the corners better than your competitors, can this difference justify the higher price you're charging for your product? So that's the real question. And of course, right, so electronics realize this as well. So they have made a lot of innovations into their entire go-to-market strategy. Just one second. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. Do you need to pick something else? So the company invested heavily in its app, right? So in its app development to make the vacuum cleaner smarter, right? So to be able to find the charging base, to cover the area more thoroughly. On top of that, the triangular design, right? And along with other features, also won the prestigious design award of the year so that it really helps the publicity of the product when it went to the market. And in addition to this, the company, of course, invested in the uh, functional for, uh, features of the product. So in terms of you know, being able to identify the, uh, the surface better and then being able to have a longer battery life and have a longer cleaning path. So all of these combinations is trying to justify the premium price that the company uh, you know, is willing to charge, right? So now the product meets the market and let's see what happens. It turns out that the sales are less than fact, fact, uh, satisfactory. So the realized sales were only a third of the projected number. Well, the, uh, the, some of the obvious reasons include the price is higher than the competitors, the competition is throat cutting, there are many good products in the market. And interestingly, if you look at the consumer feedback, right, so some consumers actually saw stories right, posted by others saying that, oh, my vacuum cleaner is not that automatic. It got stuck underneath the bed, it got stuck underneath the sofa, and it doesn't really clean the entire room, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So all of this negative news, right? although it's not directed to uh, pure I-9, but it actually makes people less confident in the entire product category. It also actually makes uh, people especially not willing to try the high-end product. So as a combination of all of these reasons, the sales of that year wasn't you know, good enough. So now what? It turns out that, right? So research shows that 90% of the deliberate business strategies actually failed in, in the real world, right? So in practice, that's not the end of the world. What's more important is that the company should act fast and be able to come up with an emergent plan as fast as possible. So electronics really needs to find this emergent plan to make things work, but how? 
So they decided to do a soul searching. They realized that in this entire process, they have been using the product centric view. So they see themselves as a manufacturer of a hardware, right? So a manufacturer of the, uh, the vacuum cleaner. So what they try to do is to make the product features as, you know, as good as possible, right? So that they hope the market will like it. And then they decided to shift this product centric view into a consumer centric view. How should we start doing the consumer centric view? Of course, you should look, turn to the consumers and then really look at how consumers interact with your products, how consumers are using your products. And electronics realize that they actually have eight months of data in a test market, but they never really analyze the data. So they decided to really look into consumer usage data and then try to generate insights. So this is what the data shows. So on the screen, you see two lines, right? So the bottom one is actually the accumulated, right? So the number of sales units per day. So the horizontal axis is time, right? So over time, we have the beginning of the sales until the end, okay? And then the bottom line corresponds to the, uh, the unit sales. The top line, the green line is actually the usage. So that's the areas, total areas cleaned per day. So the most obvious difference between the two lines is this growth rate, right? So the bottom line has an almost flat growth rate. How about the green one? We call that exponential, right? So in the, the, the consumer usage actually exhibited the exponential growth rate. In the business world, if you see exponential, your blood should boil and you should be jumping up and down, right? And this is exactly what happened to electronics. So they realized that the consumer usage exponential, but what does that mean to their business? They're gonna do the data-driven you know, uh, business implications, right? So business plan transformation. So on the left, so I'm gonna show you the data trends. What does the data say? And on the right, let's try to translate the data insights into the business implications. First of all, we noticed the exponential rate of the consumer usage. So that literally means that as time goes, people are using the product more and more. So then translating into business insights that gives encouraging signal to electronics that their product seems working. However, they need to find a way to overcome the adoption barrier. They have to encourage people to start using it. And then over time, the usage growth will become exponential, right? So the usage will actually pick up on its own. Okay, so that's one thing. And secondly, an exponential curve typically suggests that there are two groups of users. Because after all, right, so this is a vacuum cleaner, you don't expect people to start cleaning all day long, right? So the exponential growth is likely contributed by a group of heavy users, and then the rest of them are light users. And typically, right, so this follows a 20-80 split. So 20% of your consumers are heavy users, and the remaining 80% of the consumers are the so-called light users, right? Well then, what does this mean for the business implication? Well, it's a question for the company. Should we expand to the non-consumers who traditionally would not be interested and would not be confident to buy this high-end products, right? So should we try to monetize the light users, right? So in addition to just try to you know, make the sales happen, and if this makes sense for the business, how can we achieve that? So the management team at Electronics, right? After they really translate the, business, the data insights into business implications, they realized that there were more opportunities that brought by digital transformation, brought by the new trends in consumer behavior, which they are not familiar with and they haven't been monetized, okay? So if we pause and think about this, 
as a manufacturer for hardware, electronics have traditionally just been doing monetized device sales, right? So they make a device, they sell it, they make a profit. But now the data suggests that they should focus on usage because usage grows exponentially in their, for their product. So in other words, is it possible for them to monetize the service as well? Right, so the consumer service, does this provide a new opportunity for them? You probably noticed that I used the icon of a razor and the blade in this, in this screen. So uh, why do I do that, right? So this actually goes back to the very famous razor and blade business model. So in marketing, and then in a lot of business practice, right? So razor and blade, they come as a pact, as a combo. So it's well known that the manufacturer of the razors, they do not make money by selling razors. They make money by selling the blades. The blades selling, right? So the blade sales are recurring. And then you can actually make more money by the recurring business rather than just by selling the, the device once. Selling a device typically means the end of the relationship, right? So once the sales occur, the relationship with the consumer ends. But if you sell blades, the sales transaction marks the beginning of a relationship. So once you actually sell the first blade, the next blade will come when the first blade went out, et cetera, right? So this is a more continuous, more recurring relationship with the customer. So it's very interesting that this famous razor and blade business model become relevant to a large, much larger number of businesses in the, in, uh, in the business world nowadays because of digital transformation and because of the changes in people's behavior. So in electronics case, so the question becomes really relevant for them. Okay, now what is my razor and what should be my blade? So as inspired by the data pattern, right? By the usage pattern, electronics decided to try to, to experiment the subscription model. So they originally see themselves as a hardware manufacturer, but now they want to shift to a service provider. So this business model nowadays is, is termed as hardware as a service, right? As opposed to software as a service. So this is known as HAAS. Okay. So if you want to use the subscription model, how should you price it? Right, that's a new task for the company. So they are faced with two options. So first, you can just charge a monthly fee, right? A fixed monthly fee as your price for the service. Well, if you charge a fixed monthly fee, this seems like a rental model, right? So this is the familiar rental model. However, the price is not that easy to determine because if the fee is too high, the non-consumers will not adopt your product. But if the fee is too low, the company is very hard to make a profit, then you don't have a bottom line. So electronics decided to use uh, the model called usage-based pricing, so also known as UBP. The essence of the usage-based pricing basically link the cost to the usage level, right? So in this graph, you see that the vertical axis is price, the horizontal axis is the level of usage. So if a customer does not value the, the product that much, so meaning that the customer have a light usage need for the product, then you pay a minimum fee. If the customer has a very, very high valuation of the product, so in other words, if the customer uses the product a lot, then you pay a capped fee. So in other words, you do not want to penalize your heavy customers, right? So your loyal, the most loyal customers. You, so the price is capped at the maximum level. In the middle of the range, the usage, the cost is actually linearly related with your usage. So this type of pricing structure is more and more common nowadays if you look around. So in the business world, right? So for software, you know, if you do a media consumption, so sometimes right, you're on eBooks, et cetera. So your e-reader is the, uh, the razor and your digital books are the blades. 
but you pay a, a fee per book, right? So your fee of using the device, using the service is related to your consumption level. So this type of pricing structure seems to really link the cost with the level of valuation of the consumer, right? So some of you probably will be like, really? That sounds a little bit different, right? So different from my expectation. Are people okay to pay a price, right? To pay a different price each month just for the vacuum cleaner? That sounds a little bit hard to digest. I hear you, right? So actually in the MBA classroom, it's not that important to rush into a yes, no answer. So we encourage people to really debate to think more comprehensively, right? So we encourage the students to think about the pros and cons of the different solution, right? So it's not that important to come up with the answer, but we want to understand like the two sides of the coin so that you will come up with the answer more confidently. So in this case, let's actually try to think about what's the value of this new business model provided to the consumer. So in other words, what is the value proposition for the subscription model? Well, if you don't pay for the device, you just pay based on your usage. That seems like the starting cost is lower, right? So we can think about the multiple things, right? So it's probably not exclusive, but the major points include the following. So the upfront cost for people to use the device is lower. And especially for the non-consumers, uh, non right? So the non-customers who traditionally would, tr traditionally would not uh, adopt this product. So if you're a heavy user, right? So if you really want to buy the product, of course you can still buy it, right? So the subscription is additional, uh, is additional model that the company was experimenting at that time, okay? And then secondly, so the cost in the subscription model is related to the value, right? So people can actually really see that the value is aligned with the cost that they have to pay for using the service. And then, for those of you who, who probably have already owned a vacuum cleaner, you know the pain points, right? So the pain point is, well, the, uh, the, the machine may break, the battery may die, right? And then you may need to uh, have the replacement of the accessories, right? But if you're using the service, of course you get the replacement benefits. So the subscription model also provides a so-called hassle-free peace of mind when you use a product you no longer need to worry about replacing, right? So the accessories, the batteries, et cetera. So in the Western markets, right? So the consumers may actually have multiple floors and then they can have, they can hire multiple units per household. That of definitely, right? So brings utility than just uh, purchasing multiple uh, units. Last but not least, because the consumers no longer own the device, they hire one, right? So they, they subscribe one. And then once they're done with the device, they can return the device to the company. And then the, the product, right? So the, uh, the hardware can be reboxed and then sent to another household. So this second line, right? So really makes the product cycle more sustainable and it's appealing to people who appreciate the environmental sustainability, right? So these are all the uh, potential values that the subscri subscription model can provide to the consumers. How about some challenges? Some of you probably would think, um, I don't think I understand this subscription model, right? It takes a little bit effort to really see the value. Uh, that's legitimate. So many consumers may not be familiar with this um, uh, user-based pricing model, especially for a household appliance, right? So this is not a pricing model they are familiar with. And of course, right, so you don't have a fixed fee. So that, which means that the price you pay for the subscription actually varies by the area that you clean in the month. So there is uncertainty for the future cost. So some consumers may actually get a sticker shock when they receive the bill, they were like, Jesus, I'm cleaning my house, but uh, I have to pay a higher price, right? Consumers overall, they do not like uncertainty. So that can potentially be the hassle for adopting the, uh, the subscription model. On the supply side, there are also challenges, right? So electronics, in order to do the subscription model, they have to develop new capacities. 
So particularly, right, so they have to be able to monitor the usage per device and be able to bill according to the usage, right? So this recurring billing system is actually not without challenges. So these are the new cap capacities that the company didn't have at that time, right? When they transit from a hardware manufacturer to a hardware service company. On top of that, they also realize that they encounter something new. So now they have direct and continuous relationship with customers. So this customer relationship brings a lot of potential benefits, but also this is something that the company didn't have a lot of experience with. How do I serve the customers on a continuous basis, right? So let me actually go, uh, go to the next slide to really explain what this continuous and uh, direct customer relationship mean. So in the business world, if you're a manufacturer, right? So what is the current most popular channel for you to sell your products or for you to reach your consumer? You sell your products to distributor. The distributors will distribute to retailers. The retailers will sell to the consumers, right? So the distributor and retailers basically make up the channel to the consumer, okay? And then the distributors and the retailers, they actually play a very important role in this entire channel. So they not only uh, represent the footprint of the manufacturer, but also they take on the role of co-marketing. So retailers, right, because they face the consumers directly, they will promote the product for their, you know, for, uh, on behalf of the manufacturer. So they can do their promotion, they can do display advertising, they can really try to highlight the features, the attractive features of the product. So the co-marketing actually plays an important role in the entire sales channel. However, this is not without limitations, right? So the consumers are the customers of the retailers directly. So retailers know the consumer the most. And then the usage information or the consumer feedback will be filtered and then returned to distributor to manufacturer. So with this indirect channel, there's gonna be some loss of information, right? So this is the world that electronics, you know, used to live with, right, live in. But now with the subscription model, so they will develop the capacity to monitor the usage directly. So in other words, the consumer usage data actually get fed into manufacturer directly. So now the manufacturer have much better knowledge about consumer behavior and the consumer usage. However, if you want to serve the, uh, the consumers better, right? If you want to maintain the service level, so the manufacturer really have to know the consumer, really have to maintain a direct access to consumer. So in other words, to say the least, so manufacturer needs to have a website so that the consumer can subscribe to the service and then to get to request the service directly. So electronics realize that the direct to consumer channel is something that brings potential benefits, but also is a new requirement for them in order for the subscription model to, to work. So this emergence of direct to consumer channel and the, and the subscription model in general, right? Is nothing new to just electronics. So this is actually one of the major trends related to digital transformation. So I understand that the term digital transformation can mean a lot of different things, right? But in the consumer product market and in the, uh, you know, in the, in the marketing field, so direct to consumer channel is one major trend related to digital transformation. It's very hard not to mention direct to consumer and then the, uh, the different business model when you talk about digital transformation. Okay, so this is a very important framework. So I'm gonna pause here and then take a look at the, uh, the question, potential questions in the chat. Uh, so I see the comment of uh, the PPT. Yes, I'm. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah. So I will. Uh, I will work with the MBA office to make the uh, slides available. 
So let me uh, take a look at some of the other questions. Okay, yeah. So I see many interesting questions in the chat. I'm very happy to see these questions. Um, so how about this? Let me try to get to um, the remaining questions, right? So towards the end of the lecture, um, because some of the questions will get answered, probably will get answered in the second half of, of the lecture, but we do have time uh, to, um, to answer the more uh, common questions. So, but thanks so much for your question. So by the end of the lecture, right? So if you have to just have one picture in your mind, I would recommend that you have this picture in your mind because that really represents a lot of uh, the, the trends that a lot of businesses are, are working with nowadays. So some of the companies, they used to be D2C, for example, Amazon, but now they realize that they probably will appreciate the offline retailing channels, right? And then a lot of companies, a lot of businesses are, have always been doing the traditional distributor retailing session. And then they realize that with digital technologies, they have the opportunity to reach consumer directly. So what is the, you know, what's the opportunity? So to have, have they left some uh, benefits on the table, right? Have they left the money on the table? So these are all the questions that a lot of business are, uh, you know, are pondering nowadays. Uh, so I encourage you, to remember this graph by the end of the lecture. Okay, so going back, right, to the case of electronics, they also realize that they have many tough questions to ask themselves. So first of all, what is the strategic importance of B2C? Right, so this additional channel. Should D2C, right, so the direct to consumer channel be a major contributor to their revenue model? Or should it just be a nice complement to the mainstream existing re uh, district retailing channel, right? So if the company wants to make D2C the major contributor of the revenue, then they have to realize that the distributors and retailers will no longer be incentivized to do the co-marketing for them, right? So that basically means that the entire marketing brand awareness building, right? So will fall on the shoulder of the manufacturer. So do you have the capacity to do the brand awareness building, right? Do you have the skill? Do you have the resource to build your brand so that the consumers will know to go to you directly rather than rely on the it, you know, existing retailing network that, you know, exists in the offline brick and mortar store. So that's the, that's a very tough question, but that's a question if you're doing the subscription model, direct to consumer model, you have to consider, okay. And then for electronics, right? They have this mature, you know, retailing network. So for them, making a 100% to a shift to D2C, probably this is not the, the best timing, right? This is not the time, they're not ready for that, okay? Well, if you're adding the D2C channel to the existing retailing channel, then the question is, how do you manage D2C without upsetting your retailing partners? If they get the sense that you are departing from them, are they still you know, willing to invest in co-marketing with you, right? How do you balance? How do you balance the new channel with the existing channel? And again, these are not easy questions, but are, these are actual, you know, relevant questions that a lot of companies are pondering nowadays. Well, so I want to, I, I show you this, this example of Pure i9. It's more like a motivating example, right? So you see that a traditional hardware manufacturer, when they, when they see that their products are not picked up by the market, they realize that they have to do some hard rethinking. So they have to shift their mindset from a product-centric point of view to look at what consumers are doing, how consumers are using their product so that they can rethink about, they re rethink product and services as a solution to meet the consumer needs. So in a test market, they experimented the subscription model and it seems working. So in the test market, the subscription, the subscription model gain traffic. But the tough question is, how do they scale it up? 
right? How do they go for, forward? Can they scale it up to a to to more markets, right? To a larger markets or to more uh, product lines, right? So, what? But for a Fortune 500 company, the changes are not going to happen really fast, right? So it definitely doesn't happen overnight. So that's why I want to show you another example. So this time, let's look at a company of a relatively smaller scale. So let's see how this company actually encounters a somewhat similar question, and then how they come up with the uh, the remodel, right? So the the new different uh, a, a new business model, and how they answer some of these questions that electronics were uh, was facing. Okay. So when we talk about the second example, I want to I encourage you to think about the similarities and the differences between the two examples, right? Because it's always a great idea to see that even the same business model, they may work somewhat differently in different markets for different consumers, right? So under different circumstances. So it's more interesting for the learning to actually realize that, you know, the answer sometimes is it depends, but let's try to understand the pros and cons so that we can, you know, answer future questions with more confidence. So the second example is GoPro. So GoPro is known as the active camera for people who have a, you know, adventurous, right? So active lifestyle. So for those of you who do a lot of outdoor activities, right? So surfing, you know, like skiing, swimming, you probably have already known the brand. So GoPro is a California based brand, right? So it's an American brand. Do we have someone who know the brand? Okay. So GoPro, right? So the uh, the founder of the, the company, the founder of the company uh, is adventurous himself, right? So he realized the pain points of taking photos and videos when he was doing this, you know, somewhat more extreme activities, right? So the uh, the smartphones at that time didn't work really well for him. And he was determined to come up with a camera, with a device that can really suit the needs of this active lifestyle uh, needs, right? So ever since the beginning, so the founder made, was determined, right, to design the best product features for that purpose. So since the beginning of the company, right, so they actually innovate on the product features constantly. So the beginning was underwater film and then digital camera, and then wide angle lens, right? So longer recording time so that you can take the videos, right? So with a little bit better um, uh, configuration and the high definition in 2009. So two years later, low light conditions and then lighter weight, more modes. So the company actually made sure that the camera can be attached to a lot of different services, uh, surfaces, right? So that you know, you can exercise without worrying about where the camera is, your hands are free, and then you can do these um, outdoor exciting um, activities, and then so on. So actually pretty much every year, so the company made some innovations to their model and they have new models coming out. And then until 2020, right? So they also introduced the selfie screen. <laughs> so to, to make it more appealing, right? For people who exercise. So now let's think about the traditional framework, right? So the product market fit and also the four Ps. So for this active camera, the product and market fit is clear, right? So GoPro is a product that serves a niche market. So the market is for the people who have active lifestyle, okay? So it's a very clear, crystal, a crystally clear product and market fit. So now let's think about the four Ps. Product, price, place, and a promotion. So the product features, right? So we'll make sure that the company makes sure that these are the optimal, the best, you know, in the market features that can help people take photos and videos for active lifestyle. And then they decided to go with the mainstream retailers because the company, you know, started as small, right? So they don't have a lot of footprint, right? So to reach the consumer. So having the co-partnership with the mainstream retailer means a lot to them in the beginning. So their products are sold by Walmart, Best Buy, et cetera, okay. And then price. 
So the latest model was priced at about $500, right? So in the market, this is, you know, like not a cheap product, right? So it's a somewhat premium price. And then last promotion, right? Because of the many new models coming out each year. So the company realized that they have to do heavy discounts to year old models, okay? Because once you have new model coming out, the old models have to be discounted heavily, okay? And secondly, very interestingly, so the company realized that they should do influencer marketing or social media marketing, rely on user-generated content and then some you know, well-known figures, right? So in the, uh, who has active lifestyle because the nature of the product is very interesting, right? So the product is to take these exciting moments, right? So once you go to some exotic place, uh, you do surfing, when you do you know, skiing, et cetera. So people are interested in the content and then the content has an easier time going viral and then going spread out, right? So being picked up, uh, becoming you know, kind of interesting content uh, that gets circulated on social media. So the promotion strategy for their promotion strategy Influencer marketing and social media marketing plays an important role, right? So think about this element. Does electronics has that have that? Okay. So these marketing four Ps and then the nice fit with a niche market, right? So the product and market fit actually worked really well for GoPro company. So the company was profitable since the beginning. And then the whole combination actually make it you know, uh, really enjoy a decade of healthy growth. So the, uh, the sales was always, right? So, you know, increasing and then the company was able to make a, a very comfortable profit from the beginning. But as the, as the CEO put it, healthy sales numbers actually can mask a lot of problems. You don't realize something was wrong until your numbers become red. And that moment, arose uh, for GoPro in 2016. So that year, the problem started to arise. So the company realized that consumers really established an expectation. They expect a new model each year, which puts a lot of pressure on product innovation. How can you keep innovating right? so, so fast for a company you know, that has limited resources? And then also, consumers become very price sensitive to year old models. So that means only the main flagship model that year can get the regular price. All the other products, SKUs, have to be heavily discounted. And then also because of their market has been recognized by the competitors, they, they saw stronger competition from smartphones, right? So some of you realize that it's actually not too bad to just take a video or photo using your smartphone. Smartphones become waterproof nowadays, right? And also there were more cheaper brands, right? So uh, entering the market as well. As a result of all of this, profits lost, right? So the company saw a, you know, a negative profit that year and also their stock, stock prices plunged by 40%. So now it's a, it's a painful moment for the company. They have to pause and then do the soul searching again. So they also followed the product centric to consumer centric logic, right? So they started to think about, okay, should, we should change our thinking, right? So think about how consumers are using our product, just like electronics. So they used to see the different features, right? Just as product features, for example, underwater, high definition, wider lens, et cetera. But now they decided to think about how do these features actually meet the consumer needs, right? So if you take the product centric view, you tend to ask your question. You tend to think about your, your business model this way. Let's produce the best product and then people will like it. But I should probably put a quote. Hopefully people will like it because you don't know until you meet the market. But if the company is taking a consumer centric view, you will think about this question. What jobs do people hire our product for? Consumers are not interested in your product per se. Consumers are interested in completing a job. They happen to need your product for that job. Okay, so what is the job that the GoPro potential customers are hiring GoPro for? 
you probably will come up with something close to this, right? Seems like they need a device or they need a solution to capture and share the exciting moments. But if you think about the GoPro product, the camera can capture the moments, but how does it do the sharing part? So the company probably is only doing partially the job, right? A partial job, not the entire job that consumers are hiring them for. So with this moment, the company decides, right? So GoPro decides to have uh, already have a, come, a comeback plan. So their comeback plan consists of two major components. The first component is on the sharing part, right? So after you capture the, the uh, after you take a photo, then before you can share it, you probably need to edit, uh, edit your pictures and videos, right? To make it uh, more suitable for social media sharing. So GoPro acquired an app company called Quick. And then this company, right? So this app is to do the video and uh, video uh, editing and then in an easier way. So this is to better meet the entire whole package of the consumer needs. And then secondly, just like electronics, so GoPro also realized that they should, they should not just focus on selling the hardware. They want to provide a solution. And the solution actually can be a combination of the device and the service, right? So, and the software service. So their subscription model is offered to the consumer, right? So to the GoPro owners at $50 per year. If you subscribe to the package, then you have unlimited access to the app, you also have unlimited access to the cloud storage, right? So that, you know, you can store the videos and the, you know, the photos on the cloud storage. Not only that, right? So people, uh, the subscribers can enjoy the discounts for the branded accessories. And then the subscription package also includes the no question asked, the damage replacement benefits for the camera. So the hassle-free ease of mind, right? So that we have seen uh, for the uh, electronic example. So with the whole subscription package, now we see the uh, interesting D2C channel again, right? So GoPro used to work with Best Buy and then you know a Walmart, right? So for their traditional retailing channel, but now they have a subscription direct to consumer channel. Okay, so now they offer two ways, right? So con consumers can purchase their product. And then they decided to do a data-driven solution to, their, to the questions that we pose for electronics, right? What is the strategic role of D2C? Should they be a major contributor to your revenue or should it just be a nice compliment? And how do you maintain the relationship with existing retailers if you're not ready to go D2C 100%, right? So GoPro decided to do a data-driven approach to answer these questions. So they realized that consumers can make a purchase either through the traditional retailers or made directly with the company at their website. So if the consumers made a purchase at Best Buy or Walmart, right? So they purchase their camera, they go home and they open the app. So once they activate the app, they will be asked whether they are interested in the subscription. So the uh, subscription rate is 15%, okay? However, if a consumer actually made the purchase at the website, so the company gave them a heavy discount for the whole combo. So if you subscribe, right? So if you subscribe to the service, when you make a purchase of the camera, you get a heavy discount. As a result of that, 90% of the people decided to subscribe. These numbers look too good to be true, right? So some of you who have a critical mind, maybe like professor, wait a minute. I think people who make a purchase at the retailers and the people who make a purchase directly at the website, they probably are fundamentally different to begin with. That's legitimate. It's probably true, right? But that difference probably won't be able to explain the 75% difference. There's substantial difference here. So something is going on with the direct-to-consumer channel, right? If you think about the retailer channel, consumers make a purchase at the retailer store. They go home, 
and then they decide whether to subscribe or not. So there is a separation between the location of the purchase and the subscription purchase, subscription decision, and there is a time difference as well, right? So that segmentation between location and time probably explains some of the, uh, the drop in the subscription model. And in addition to that, on the D2C channel, the brand has more control in their D2C. They can decide how heavy a discount they give to the consumer if they purchase a whole panel, a whole, whole package, right? So the, if the subscription rate is not high enough, they can consider heavier discount, right? So this control, the better control, also gives the GoPro some flexibility in deciding their subscription model. So this sounds like D2C well, will play an important role for the subscription model. However, nothing comes for free, right? So it comes in free. So in order for people to go directly to your website, as I mentioned, the manufacturer, GoPro, will have to do the brand building all on their own, right? So how do you build your brand, brand awareness without the help from your co-marketing uh, partners? So in the case of GoPro, it's slightly easier because of the nature of their product, right? So consumers may use GoPro cameras and then they make exciting content. Once they post their content on social media, other people get excited, it's interesting content. And then by this you know, user-generated content, right? So the brand name also gets spread out, okay? So this type of you know, uh, social media marketing actually is to the advantage of GoPro in, uh, when they build their D2C model. But of course, right, so GoPro also feel like they're not ready to switch to D2C 100%. So how do you balance the new channel with the existing retailer channel? So in, in GoPro's case, they have multiple SKUs. So they realize that how about we only sell the flagship model, the full price model on the D2C channel, on their direct website, so that they can promote the subscription along with it and then all the other models, right? All the other SKUs will go through the distributor and the retailer because the other models have heavy discounts, right? So it's naturally, naturally appealing for people who are more price sensitive. So by doing this differentiation, right? So the manufacturers actually has a lower chance of upsetting the existing retailing, uh, retailing partners. And then the flagship model is the model they want to promote the most. And then they do it in their direct to consumer channel so that they have more control over the pricing and then the combo of the subscription model. Okay, right. So the GoPro model, right? So as, as we see here is another example of the razor and the blade, right? So razor and blade business model. So GoPro, used to make money by selling cameras, but the innovation pressure is high. And then people become price sensitive over time, right? Once you make a sales of your camera, you lost contact with consumer, right? So make a sales marks the end of the relationship. But now they shifted their model, right? So from selling camera to uh, providing subscription. So now the subscription become their blades, right? And then you maintain a continuous relationship to the consumer. And in order for consumer to renew your subscription, then you have to innovate on the service, right? To make the subscription worthwhile, okay? And then by making this reason and blade swift, right? So GoPro realized that consumers actually can, can do their jobs, the jobs, remember the jobs? So consumers can do the jobs better because now they have a camera especially made for active lifestyle and they have the subscription service so that they can edit the video, they can share the video easier. The subscription business for GoPro really took off. And then interestingly, subscription model is also valued in the stock market because it marks consumer lock-in, right? So once consumers subscribe, so if they're somewhat satisfied with your service, they will come back next year, right? So you have the recurring revenue, it's more predictable, so this type of business model is appreciated in the stock market. So for GoPro, their stock price tripled in recent years. So now you have seen the two examples, right? So we see that 
The first example is electronics. And then second example is GoPro. Even though they are in very different consumer product category, but both of them have gone through some strategic shift. So they used to be a hardware manufacturer, but now they tend to think of themselves as providing a consumer solution. So the solution doesn't have to be device only. It, can, it doesn't have to be software only. It doesn't have to be a, surf, a, a service only. It's actually a combination of the hardware, the software, and the service. However, combination can make your solution work for the jobs, right? So for consumer jobs to meet the consumer needs better. And in electronics case, right? So they change from selling the hardware to hardware as service. And in GoPro's case, right? So they change from selling the hardware to software to somewhat more like a software as a service example. But the underlying logic is to provide a consumer solution, right? So by adopting a consumer centric view. So I encourage you to think about the similarities and the differences between the two examples, right? So very briefly, so let's think about the difference here. So the GoPro, in GoPro's case, so seems like consumers, right? So it's faster for consumers to endorse their subscription model. There were multiple reasons behind it, right? Because it's providing, you know, the cloud storage, the video, the app, the video editing app. So it seems like it's easier for consumer to perceive the continuous value, right? To justify for the, uh, the subscription fee. Okay, that's one element. So in other words, for a subscription model to work, consumer have to perceive the value, the continuous value that they derive from your subscription. So secondly, we see that D2C has a lot of potential benefits. Direct to consumer has a lot of potential benefits, but it also, you know, have to, you have to be able to have a brand, right? To have a strong brand. So in, in GoPro's case, the popularity of their content actually helps building the brand, right? So with a little bit easier time on social media. So that could be an interesting feature to consider. And, and also, right, so in terms of the balance between D2C and retailing. So GoPro has multiple SKUs so that they can differentiate the different channels, right? So that only the flagship goes to D2C. And then the, the more price sensitive consumers they can go to the retailers to buy the, old, the year older uh, brands. So which reason is the more dominant reason? Could it be just one reason that makes the subscription model work? Or is it a, a combination of all of these, right? So that, those are the questions I want you to keep thinking of, right? So we don't necessarily have an answer to say, it's definitely this reason, not that, right? So you need to think about the, uh, which one plays uh, what role in specific business environments. Okay. So again, to summarize, right? So in GoPro's case, continuous valuation, perceived continuous value, right? Brand awareness for D2C, okay? And then uh, the balance between D2C and then existing retailing channel. So with that, I want to invite you to think about the question that I posed in the beginning of the lecture. What business are we in? So actually, we really think we need to think about this as what business are we really in? So we should not think about the business, your business, based on your products you're making or your competitors. Because with digital technology, your business model and your product categories now get blurred, right? So you may no, you may no longer be just a manufacturer of a hardware. You actually you know, maybe providing an entire solution to consumers. So a lot of things are under digital transformation. How do we soldier through the digital transformation? We can adopt the consumer-centric business thinking, right? So when people encounter the word consumer-centric, they know that it makes sense, but they often feel like, but how? How should I, how should I do the business thinking using consumer-centric? So hopefully today's two examples, right? give you some ideas to follow, right? By looking at the consumer usage pattern and then by looking at the jobs to be done by consumers. And then think about, is your product fulfilling the entire jobs, right? Or how can you make a combination of your product to fulfill the jobs? So in other words, I encourage you to define your business, 
right, based on customer needs and then to provide the optimal customer solution. So with that, we reach the end of the, uh, the webinar, the exclusive lecture. Uh, so I know that some of my former students uh, are also in the webinar. It's good to, uh, so for them and also to all of you. So enjoy learning and enjoy lifelong learning. So uh, thank you so much for being here. So for the remaining time, uh, I'm gonna take a look at the questions and then to answer some of the questions. Uh, so I'm gonna first go by the order uh, that I received the question. So the first question uh, is, uh, may I ask about the methodology to identify the correlation, that uh, the correlation differentiation between usage and uh, units? Um, so I would say, uh, so hope I understand the question correctly, but I would say that the, um, so the units, right? So I, I uh, interpret the units as a device. So if you think about the, uh, the device dif uh, differentiation, right? So you think about the features. So what are the product features? But if you think about the usage, you have to look at the data, right? So how consumers are really engaged with your product. Usage is a broad term on its own. It could relate to like, um, you know, how people's uh, just behavior of usage, or it could also relate to you know, whether people are engaging with the product slightly differently. So I would say focus uh, usage is really more about the consumer centric view. So think about whether your consumers interact with the product differently from how they interact with your competitors products. And then the units, right? So the device differentiation, sometimes it's based on the uh, product centric view just look at you know, the features, et cetera. But the perceived differentiation on the supply side may not be aligned with the perceived differentiation in consumer's mind. So that's the differentiation I want to highlight for today's lecture. Okay. Uh, very good question. Um, so the next one is also a good question, right? So how do I know when to enhance the retention of heavy customers and then when to expand to non-customers, right? So this actually is a question that pretty much all companies are you know, working with, right? So they, are, they try to find a solution. So I would say uh, this question really depends on what you can deliver and then what's your goal. So for example, right? So uh, the heavy customers typically are known as the members, right? So if, you're, if your business actually is more recurring, so retaining heavy customers will be very important to you. But in some customer domains, right? In some product domains, the, uh, the, the, the usage may not be a uh, high frequency and may not be recurring that much. So for this type of business, having uh, non lighter customers probably will be more important. I think the answer somewhat depends on the nature of your business. Uh, so do we have some comment as well, right? So let me see. the. Uh, Penetration versus loyalty. Yeah, so if you believe penetration is more important, then expanding to the non-heavy users right, will be more important than retaining their, the customer loyalty um, because the customer may not be loyal, particularly to a uh, home appliance device, right? So we also see people have some reflections about examples that they see. Uh, Netflix is a razor and blade. And the ebooks is even video games is a reason play, right? You will be able to download a lot of uh, games for free. So that's your reason. And then you make in game purchase, that's the blade. So if you look around, you're going to see lots of razor blade. So as I highlighted in the lecture, the razor and the blade business model actually is more relevant nowadays. It's actually relevant to a much larger, uh, a much broader um, spectrum of businesses. So that's why I really want people to keep that in mind. And people ask for the professor, uh, the, the PPT, yes. Uh, so I'm, I'm willing to, uh, to work with the MBA office to see how can we make that available. And by the way, I have uh, my email on the screen. So if you have more thoughts, 
I would very much love to uh, hear your questions and comments. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me uh, directly. Um, okay, so maybe given the time, <laughs> given the time, so uh, I'm sorry that I won't have time to cover all the questions. So hopefully we cover um, some of the common themes that uh, appear in the question. And uh, again, it's my great pleasure to be able to meet everyone here, even though virtually. Uh, so good luck with your work, with your study. And, uh, and again, like be, um, be a lifetime, lifetime learner. So that's really the, the philosophy uh, at SIPS that we highly value at SIPS. So enjoy the rest of the event. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, uh, a big thank you to uh, Professor Jiang for that, uh, that sharing. Uh, we're not quite done just yet. Uh, as I mentioned, the, uh, the final part of our lecture today uh, will be an alumni panel. Uh, we'll get to speak to uh, four of our recent alumni that have gone through the, uh, the MBA process. So delighted to, uh, to, to, to welcome you here. Uh, interesting reflections from uh, Professor Zhang's uh, lecture there. Uh, actually, it's, it was quite interesting to see the example of the robot vacuum cleaner. Uh, at Siebes, we not only have robot vacuum cleaners, but also a uh, lawn mower. So even uh, on campus, we've been influenced by rethinking marketing for the, for the digital age. Um, so uh, here to share some kind of uh, deeper insights uh, for everybody today. Um, as I mentioned, I'm happy to invite back uh, uh, some of our uh, alumni. Um, what we're gonna do is have a quick uh, curated Q&A, uh, which will be hosted by my, myself. Uh, and then afterwards, well, what I would like to do during the, uh, the Q&A session, if you have any questions, then please feel free to drop them in the chat box, and then we'll try and get through as many of them as, uh, uh, as possible. Um, so without further ado, what I would like to do uh, is to maybe introduce one by one. Uh, so let's start with uh, Pablo. Maybe if you could unmute yourself and introduce yourself to the, to the group, a little bit about yourself. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Very happy to be this afternoon with you. Um, thank you. Thank you, CIBS. Thank you, um, James, for the invite. Um, my name is Pablo Cheleon. Um, Siebs MBA graduate in class um, 2019. I'm currently here in Singapore. Um, I'm a general manager for VTEX in Southeast Asia. Um, I'm currently responsible. I was the first one um, here in, in Asia opening up the office and now um, working with, with the broader team, um, expanding our operations across APAC. Very happy to be this afternoon with you. Thank you. Thank you, Pablo. Uh, next, let's move over to uh, Jane. Uh, Jane, why don't you uh, unmute yourself and say hello to the uh, to the audience today? Hi there. Good afternoon, everyone. So my name's Jane, Jane Kwok. I was part of the graduating class of MBA 2016. Um, so after graduation, I stayed in Shanghai and currently I'm still in Shanghai and I'm working for Covestro, responsible for market development in the healthcare industry. Wonderful. Uh, welcome, Jane. Thanks for thanks for joining us. Uh, next, we'll move over to I believe our most recent uh, graduate on the on the alumni panel. So, uh, Woody, uh, I believe you you've been on campus since the introduction of the uh, the robot vacuum cleaners and lawnmowers. So, why not uh, unmute yourself and uh, and introduce yourself, please? Okay. Thank you, James. Uh, hello, everyone. Nice to meet you and uh, good afternoon. I'm Woody Yang, and uh, I'm based in Shanghai, and uh, I graduated from graduated from CIPS this year. And I'm from MB2022. Uh, currently, I work in CATC as a private wealth advisor in, um, for, the, for the rich people. And uh, before, before this, I work in Bloomberg as a financial market analyst. And uh, we conduct the credit analysis and uh, valuation use Bloomberg rich data and models to provide uh, researches on regulating changes or other growth factors. Uh, OK, thank you, James. 
Excellent. Thank you, Woody. Uh, and nice to nice to see you again. Um, next, uh, the final alumni that's joining us is uh, Jennifer Lee. Um, I believe she's here. I just saw a bicycle a fly by behind her. Uh, so welcome, uh, Jennifer. <laughs> uh, please, can you unmute yourself and introduce? Thanks. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Jennifer. Uh, I'm from Taiwan. I came to Shanghai around 2014. And then uh, sort of did my career switch to cloud computing industry, basically doing uh, chef of staff, business development, marketing, and now I'm in sales operation uh, working for Tencent Cloud. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Right. So, so my kind of first uh, question, and maybe we'll kind of try and stick with the same uh, same order. Um, so, so Pablo, I'm going to put you in the, the hot seat first. Um, <laughs> what what is kind of the obviously we've been talking today about some of the academic side of SEEBS, and, and you know, and also what it's like to be a student here. You know, you mentioned your kind of career switch and and you know, setting up this uh, this company in, in in Asia, which is fantastic. What for you, if you could pinpoint kind of the one you know kind of biggest takeaway that's had a kind of the, the biggest impact on your career or, or personal development since uh, finishing at SEEPS? Yes, yes. Um, I think um, my journey was quite interesting because if you had asked me at the beginning of my MBA career, I, I was actually aiming for the um, electro vehicle industries. I was aiming for the renewable energies. I, I wanted to do something about mobility. Um, so it was a big change of plans um, that ultimately led me to, to do a, a, a triple change, um, changing function, changing in, in, in geography, and in, in, in changing industry. Um, so one of my takeaways, ultimately, the thing that I accomplished, uh, was able to accomplish through SEEPS was that it gave me the pers perspective of what digital business is um, in a geography that it's substantially way forward um, than any other geographies in, in the world. Um, it gave me the understanding from a consumer because at that time, obviously I, I was still a, consu a consumer, um, consumer behavior and, and where, how, how does retail look in a more personalized and in more um, autom automated way uh, to engage with consumers? Now I, I, I'm in the position which I see this from the other side of which um, I'm, I'm, I'm offering retailers, enterprises, a SaaS platform that can engage with these consumers in, in, in these ways that I saw or I was able to experience um, when I was in Shanghai. Um, and, 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 and I would say the second thing that SEEPS allowed me was to experiment and to be engaged in as many opportunities, um, trips, um, workshops, um, exchange programs as, as, as I wish. Um, that was, I would not be here um, if it wasn't because of the exchange program. Um, and that really helped me position um, me forward in, into where I wanted to be at which ultimately was in, in digital retail and digital commerce. Um, so th those will be my, my, my two main takeaways from my experience at SEEPS. Great, great. And very interesting you mentioned about experimentation, I guess, kind of coming in with a focus on kind of the, you know, electric vehicles and then, you know, experimenting kind of led you down a, a you know, a slightly different path in the, yeah, in the end. Um, interesting. Okay. Uh, Jane, over to you. Uh, same, same question, kind of most impactful takeaway from the, the MBA, if you please. Mm -hmm, yeah, so I think James to answer that question, maybe two points, a bit like Pablo, two points. I chose SEEPS because I wanted to learn about China. Um, I also chose to do the MBA, not the EMBA, because I think I was on average 10 years older than uh, the average MBA student. Um, but I think for me, I mm, what I wanted to do was to learn about China, but at the grassroots level, right, to really understand what is the next generation of um, the, the Chinese um, community, how do they think? How do they start processing problems? Um, and I think for me, that was one of the biggest takeaways because I think when you're doing the SEEPS program for 18 months, you get a really solid opportunity to get to know fellow students and many have become friends for me um, to really understand the psyche here. You know, what are people really thinking about and how they think? because I think that's fundamentally actually quite different from, from where I come from, right? 
And then the second thing, also like Pablo, um, I did a huge career shift. I used to be a lawyer working in banking and also did um, also went into IB. I did a huge shift and I'm now in material sciences. So shift of function, industry and geography. And I think Siebes gave me a very valuable platform in order to engineer and navigate that shift. And I think we always talk about creativity, right? And for me, creativity is at least the way I see it is other than being artistically creative, but also to be able to join the dots, right? Creativity is to be able to transfer, transpose gems from other industries into your industry to see how it applies. And I think for me, Siebes was really a great arena for me to be able to join the dots differently. And that's helped me loads in my work. Excellent. Uh, great, great answers to, to, to kick us off. Uh, thank you, Jane. Uh, Woody, over to, over to you. Okay. Uh, thank you, James. Uh, actually, there are so many takeaways for me from SIPS, so I just uh, share uh, some of them here. First, I think is a uh, uh, very nice professors and a very nice staff or very nice alumni in SIPS, such as uh, Professor Ling Ling Zhang in today's uh, lecture. Uh, I think if you have the opportunity to, to attend the uh, Professor Zhang's uh, uh, lecture on class, it, it will be more and more wonderful. And uh, in, in the campus, we can also have so many, so many, so many opportunities to talk with our dear professors. So they can also be our very good friends. And the second, I think uh, this is a very, very good platform. And uh, uh, the school gives people so many opportunities to apply our ideas into practice and uh, mm. uh, do anything we want to do. Uh, such as uh, for me, I think uh, as a student leader, the president of MD Student uh, Finance and Advanced Club from 2020 and 2021, uh, we initiated and led a, a couple of innovative events to develop the core value of our club, such as we, 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 we hold a very, very large finance forum. And we also uh, do lots of uh, joint networkers with, with our alumni. And we also prepare some very good uh, guidance in the finance market for our students. I think uh, so. So these opportunities uh, that we can uh, improve our leadership skills, our communication skills, or our uh, strategic thinking. And finally, I think that uh, in in this we can uh, we can find we can find what we truly really love. Then in in this we can take our courage and passion and even pain to be. Uh, successful and become a who who we really are. So, so that's why I think uh, uh, CIFS gave us. But uh, uh, I also think that CIFS also gave us so many chance to make contribution to the community. That's uh, uh, that means that we can be a responsible leader in the future, when in our family or in our company or even in the in the whole community. Okay, thank you, James. Uh, thank you, Woody. Uh, many, uh, many points there. Also, personally, thank you for the, the various different gatherings that uh, you arranged uh, during your time here. I enjoyed uh, a number of them. Uh, speak, uh, thank you from the staff side. Um, last but not, not least, uh, Jennifer, uh, kind of biggest takeaway from the experience here. Yeah, I, uh, I, I agree with the previous uh, three alumni. Uh, one thing I, I like to add, and it's actually my personal story, uh, before I came to China, I didn't know anyone here. I have no families here. I have no friends here. I have no work experiences here. I worked for uh, agencies or small meat companies in Taiwan. So when I came here, when I first uh, submit my resume, nobody knows me. And then for me, the, the biggest uh, takeaway or like I will say benefit is the strong networking uh, community power of uh, SIPS community. After, uh, so I got internship in AWS uh, and I worked for Microsoft, Alibaba Cloud, and now Tencent. It's not just because of myself, it's because I'm truly thankful for all the people that I met along uh, the SIPS journey that helped me. They helped me do the mock interviews. They gave me a lot of tips about how the corporate world runs, uh, what's the industry about, what's the role about, they helped me a lot during my um, career transition. And I think that's really, uh, and also like Seeps MBA has strong um, founding uh, with Seeps EMBA. So not just about the job, like you also can provision or you can actually get a lot of sharing from uh, senior alumni. I think this networking, um, like 
uh, strong bonding between the community is really, it's really unique among all the MBA schools. Mm. Mm. Thank, thank you, Jennifer. And it's interesting that you, you kind of also started with saying about kind of how the opportunity at SEEBS led to obviously kind of working for these large, uh, you know, uh, tech giants in, in, in China. And that, that kind of brings me on to probably what will be my penultimate question for the, for the panel. Um, we actually have a, a career development session that, that's led by one of our consultants here called Alex, uh, which talks about the hidden job market. Um, and that obviously there are certain jobs that are advertised, you know, widely on job sites and LinkedIn, but then there are obviously also kind of tactics that, you know, the MBAs can, can explore to proactively go after, you know, job opportunities. So, you know, maybe if we could kind of go down the panel again, starting with you, Pablo, just a little bit how you landed that job, but also kind of you know tips for the audience in terms of you know if they are looking for a new job you know through it you know by doing an MBA or even you know off their own back you know what are some of the, the kind of things you learn about positioning yourself in the kind of the highly competitive uh, job market um that's that's an interesting um question that 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 makes me quite um reflective of of my whole journey um so so what I'm gonna tell you next does not apply to most people. Um, and, and, and this was a very unique experience that I don't know if anyone here w- um, else would relate or not. But um, when I graduated from SEEBS, um, before I graduated, I, I had this, this job offer from, from VTEX. Um, so for those that don't know, VTEX is a Latin American um, SaaS e-commerce platform. Um, and I was very uh, fortunate to meet one of the co-founders um, dur- during a career fair. Um, at that time, C- um, Vtex was a private company and it had no structure in MBAs or MBAs program. So essentially I was among the very few MBAs that they had hired. Uh, and in fact, maybe that, that is hired at, at Vtex. So one of the things I had to understand was that if I came in um, to the company from an MBA perspective, expecting everything to be as what we have been taught in the in, in the two years, um, I, I was going to be a big failure. Um, so I, I had to understand that um, this this organization did not hire MBAs, hence I, I did not have to behave like one, but. I had an edge by all the different um, frameworks and structure that the MBA gave me. So my job description was very fluid at that time and I had to use my, my, my strengths. So I think the MBA allowed me to understand which were my weaknesses, which were my strengths, um, how could I put into um, work those strengths? How could I work across other teams um, collaborate, uh, communicate better? How can I manage the expectations of my bosses um, and, and be able to position myself as um, this, this MBA professional that was coming out, that had lived in, in, in China, that was interested in coming back to Asia and that I was willing to continue learning. Um, and that I think it's the main takeaway um, that during the MBA, I learned that after graduating, I should not stop learning. Um, I see that when I joined VTEX, I have never stopped learning um, until now, every single day. Um, keeping my curious minded during, I, during my MBA, I was very curious and asked a lot of questions. Keeping that curiosity open, um, which allowed me to connect with different people, um, not, in, not only in the company, but also in the industry. Um, be able to network, be able to have their experiences, um, kept me um, and, and allowed me to find this specific role for me in the company that ultimately ultimately led me to to come here back to Singapore and and open up the office here. Yeah, I, I think there's some, some interesting points there, Pablo. Thanks for sharing that. I think that one of our our uh, professors always shares that I guess one of the benefits in MBA is to kind of put structure on unstructured problems that, as you say, even if it's not a, even if the company is not specifically looking for a, you know, MBA when they're, when they're hiring, right. There's still a lot of value that, uh, that alumni uh, that, that can, that can have having passed through, through business school. Uh, great. Uh, Jane, uh, similar story for you or, or slightly different. Yeah. So I think on my side, um, I 
I think one thing I, I do want to share is that the MBA is a time, it's a time of reflection, I think, and I hope, I hope it is a time for, 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 for reflection for many who do do the program. And I say that because you invest, you decide to take 18 months of your life to, to do this program. And it's also, not only is it time invested, it's also money invested. So I do urge students, and I say to myself at the time, don't rush into the first job that you get because it might not really be that job that you're really looking for. Because I remember at the time, you know, once graduation comes around, there is a lot of pressure, <laughs> that pressure from yourself, pressure from your peers, you know, it comes from every angle, right? Every day you wake up and there is, there will be, you will face that pressure of let's just land the first job that I get. But I really urge people to really think and go for what you believe in. 18 months is a great amount of time to reflect, to really look in within and also to speak to the network that seeds offers right to figure out what you want to try what you want to want to experiment um in my case um i remember i landed my job at covestro pretty much six months after graduation but i think for me i held out i held out in the sense that i mean i did get other job offers in between but i held out and i didn't accept those offers because um, I knew that my stance was I wanted to switch from being in banking and from the legal industry into industry, right? And I could have easily gone back into those two industries, but I sort of held strong and said, I, I did the MBA for a reason. I've learned a lot. I've got a different network. I've got different skill set. Um, so let's, let's, let's fight, right? And, and to get there. And, and, to, and that's what I would really recommend every student because you will, no matter how experienced you are, how mature, how intelligent, how smart, you know, how great your network is, there will always be that pressure to take that job, first job that comes in, um, especially when you're coming close to graduation. Sure, uh, very, very interesting. Thank you, Jane. Uh, Woody, obviously it's very fresh uh, for you. Uh, did you, were you feeling the pressure towards graduation or what was, uh, what was your story? What's your takeaway on that side? Okay, thank you, James. So before SIFS, I, I, I was working in the financial services. So after SIFS, after SIFS, I still in the financial services, but I changed my function from the financial analysis to the asset and wealth management. I think that's kind of success for me uh, because uh, my expertise in, is in finance, but uh, I try to dig deep of my, my, my expertise in finance in after graduation. So I have four tips for the audience. Uh, the first one I think is uh, uh, just uh, like what we learned in the classroom. We need to be have we need to have the strategic thinking. And so strategy means that uh, we know that everybody wants to win in, in in the job market. So uh, I think the most important is that we need to think how and where to win. We need to we need to uh, analyze ourselves and uh, uh, where is our weakness, where is our strength. So. Then we need to have a very good, a very good plan. Then when we make a plan, we need to uh, put the plan to action. Then after action, I think uh, we need to uh, make uh, so many, so, so many reflections every day or every week. Then we need to adjust or change our plan because uh, maybe the job, the job market may be not the same as we think. Maybe it's uh, uh, it's better than. I think uh, our I think it's maybe it's better or maybe it's uh, worse. So as uh, so the the, the second one I think is uh, leaders to management. We need to be uh, proactive and uh, be open minded and uh, uh, try to uh, make ourselves very brief to move forward. And uh, I think uh, in the process, uh, your personal plan, branding, your personal branding is also very important. A third one I think is that uh, uh, we need to if if we have the chance, we need to make the contribution to to the civic community. Uh, such as me, I I was uh, I was granted the SIPS Strategic Contribution Award when I graduated from SIPS uh, because uh, because I think that it's kind of a uh, very good recognition from our from our school. Uh, in the process, because uh, I try to make contribution to the community, then a lot of alumni and a lot of professors, even staff in our school, they try to help me uh, when I decided to find a job in the market. So it's kind of, I think, a mutual benefit uh, to school or to myself. The final one, I think, is just uh, as part of the next of learning, because it uh, will uh, tell us, even graduating, we need to uh, continue our learning. Okay, that's all. Thank you, James.
Excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Woody. Uh, I'll just pause here to mention that if uh, anybody does have any questions for the for the panel, then please do share them in the chat box and we will uh, come to them. Uh, uh, yeah, come to them soon. Uh, Jennifer, maybe uh, you could uh, share your your tips if there's anything left uh, not said. Uh, well, I like stories. I will just start with my personal stories. Great. Uh, there are three tips. I'll go very quickly uh, just of the, because of the timing. First is focus. So this is also um, like a senior alum I shared with me and I'm gonna pass it on. Uh, so in my 18 months, it's pretty short actually, I, I would have to say for a career switch, focus. So first, what's your first priority? Is it tech, is it FMCG, is it, uh, or any other industry? Well, what's the role? So don't say, hey, I wanna do A today and then you say you wanna do B tomorrow. And of course you can have backup option, so I have three, like two to three options. So I have first priority and I have uh, two backup options. And then you put your 18 months uh, efforts into this industry understanding. So that's the first tip, focus. Uh, the second one is passion. I know it sounds a little bit, <laughs> like everybody says it, but this, is, this really happened to me when I was uh, interviewing with Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft MBA training program was my first landing job and I, I, my competitor comes from uh, all MBA schools worldwide, Walton, Harvard, uh, INSEAD. And I was, the, I was the first one and the youngest chief of staff of Microsoft China CEO office in the end. I beat them because I r really demonstrated my passion for tech and for cloud computing uh, during my presentation. So that's the second, and that's the HR feedback to me said, you, they may have greater presentation skills, they may have better like analytics still, but we want people who love our company and love our industry. So that's the second, uh, demonstrate your passion. And the third thing, uh, the last but not the least is not just talking. You can't say, hey, I have passion. You have to do it. So also when I was interviewing with Microsoft, uh, so I got the internship at AWS uh, before, and then uh, I did the presentation. They were like very impressed, like how really did you know the industry uh, in this short period of time? I said, during my two months uh, internship in AWS, I always think about what my competitors will do, what Microsoft will do, what Tencent will do, what Ali will do. So you get the full picture of this industry is about. And that also demonstrate your real passion about this industry and about this company. So that those are my three tips for, uh, cause I had a lot of pressure actually <laughs> when learning my first job. So I have to be like very uh, motivated and very like, you know, like highly focused on it. And that's my tips to, uh, to share with, uh, with the upcoming students if possible, yeah. Thank you, Jenna. I, I really like that you say even on the internship, you're kind of thinking from a strategic perspective of, you know, about the competitors, even before you've kind of landed that uh, that, that permanent job afterwards. Uh, very good. Uh, so first of all, I've got a question that's come through from uh, one of our friends on, on YouTube. Um, and it's asking about uh, in terms of kind of the, so it's the full time nature of the of, of the program. Uh, so maybe Pablo will we'll come back to, to, to you with this or if anybody wants to, you know, wants to, to jump in. Uh, so the, the question is, you know, could you have achieved what you've achieved by doing a different type of program or, you know, what is the, the benefit of kind of you know, stopping your work full, you know, to do a full time uh, study for um, I believe for some of the alumni, it was 18 months. But now the program is condensed a little bit to uh, to 16 months. So any thoughts on that, Pablo? Um, actually, one of my criteria um, was that I wanted a very um, long, longer program. Um, so in my case, um, it was a little bit um, longer. It was around 20 months because I, I, I did my first year at Zeeps. And then my whole second year from August um, until April, I was in um, ESA in Barcelona. So that was that was almost around 20 months. And I think that is, at least for someone that is looking for a career change, the minimum you should spend. Um, because there was a lot of self-reflection. There was a lot of self-discovery. There was a lot of um, what is it that I don't want? Um, because it's very short, yes? 18 months, 20 months is very short period of time. And there's a lot of FOMO as well. So I do remember a lot of my <clears throat> classmates 
were were running um, towards um, PEIB um, healthcare and one of the, uh, and consultancy. Um, and one of my 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 decisions early on was that I was not going to be um, applying to any role or attending to any event um, for for um, uh, IB and PE and healthcare. Um, I later made a decision not to focus on consultancy as well. Um, and that gave me more focus and more specific, um, more time to think about what I wanted to do. And it was a very long journey. So I left Shanghai knowing that I had a very strong affinity for strategy and for retail. And then when I did my exchange program, I discovered, um, which ultimately was um, at that time, um, Professor Nueno, um, his brother, I took his class, um, his brother's class in Barcelona and got very passionate about retail. So I arrived knowing that I had affinity with marketing, I had affinity with strategy, and then I, I discovered my passion for retail. And that's when I knew that my future was in digital retail. Mm -hmm. um, and, and if I hadn't spent the time um, to know what I did not want to do and did not spend the time in focusing on those classes, professors, um, content that I knew that was really very close to my heart, then maybe um, any program, yes, that lasts 10 months or 11 months or even around a year would not have been, uh, would not have allowed me. However, if you already know what you're going to do, if you already have a, maybe a, a sponsorship and, and you know where you're going to go after the MBA, then that's completely different. Yes, that's up to you and in, in, to where you decide. But I think Deeps has a very competitive advantage. Um, a year, a year and a half is a very sweet spot for you to take the time because this is the only time in your life that you can take this, this time away. Um, this is the only time. Then, then you'll, you'll have family, you'll have other responsibilities, you, you will not be as young. So, so I think this is the only time in your life that you can do and define yourself the way that you want your life to be for the next 30, 40 years afterwards. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you, Pablo. And interesting that, uh, that uh, kind of focus and uh, passion comes back up. Uh, Jane, if I come to you next, I mean, as you say, you changed also kind of quite a lot from the, you know, from the MBA journey. Uh, is it, do you feel like this would have been achievable without a full-time program or were there any other, other considerations for you in order to kind of do that, that, that full-time? Mm, yeah, full-time was also um, the key criteria for me. Um, I wanted a clean break from what I was mm. doing as I'm a big believer in order to open another door, you need to shut the other one properly. Right. So, um, yeah, so that was the criteria. And I think the benefit, the other thing, which I firmly believe what business schools are about is to be able to interact with other students. Right. Um, and so I was looking for a program that allowed me to have a longer period of time where I could interact with other students. And as I mentioned before, um, I wanted to learn more about China. So um, to have that 18 months to really get to know another country through students, right, who are Chinese and obviously from other parts of the world as well, um, it was, you know, it was also critical. And that for me is what the MBA is about, right? You know, um, having that ability to use it as a platform to spin whatever you want to do with your career and also to develop that network because the network, um, you know, I mean, it's hard to develop literally just over, you know, a digital platform, right? I, I Maybe I'm a little bit old school, but I still think nothing beats a face interaction. I think still this day, I know we've experienced COVID and we all manage, but I still, I think till this, you know, for me, it's still nothing, nothing, it still doesn't beat physical interaction. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, good, good points. Uh, Woody, over to you. Obviously, you mentioned kind of you were already in a uh, kind of the finance banking world. Um, so maybe kind of weren't changing as much as, as some of the, the others. Um, but, you know, given that and given you wanted to stay in the industry, why, you know, why the full time for you? I think uh, uh, no matter how long is the program, I think uh, how much you can take away from the SIPs, from SIPs, it totally depends on what you do and uh, how much you uh, hopefully you involve yourself into the program. I think uh, 
uh, I think MBA education is a is a, a long term long term investment. So uh, it's time to change. I think it's time to change. Since I firstly I in the I, I I go to SIPS in the on the first I think one of my my principle in my life is that uh, uh, love the life you live and uh, live the life you you love. When looking back, uh, look, looking back, I think uh, everything in SIPS for me. It's a very, very wonderful memory, such as the, the amazing lectures by the professors and the uh, uh, lovely uh, staffs and uh, the library or discussing with the uh, classmates or the teamwork uh, club activities. Uh, for me, our program is uh, 60 months, but actually uh, I stay in the campus for 20 months because of the lockdown of Shanghai. Mm -hmm. So I think there are, there are so many uh, beautiful uh, memories uh, so uh, in summary, I think that uh, uh, once you decide to to go to the MBA education, so then the, it's not a hurry to return to the job market again, because uh, uh, for any kind of success, we need the patience. So uh, we, I think uh, one of my advice is that uh, we need to be patient to to wait for wait wait for the beautiful changes to happen. Mm, I've got it. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Really. So I guess kind of given that, that, you know, that 16 or previously kind of 18 months, it just allow you that window to kind of be patient and to, you know, to really kind of find the right platform for, for you. Uh, Jennifer, was that your experience or, or anything to add to the, to the conversation around the, the, you know, the nature of kind of doing a full time program? Uh, the first, the first thing I would say is still focus. Like if you do part time MBA, that will actually distract your energy and time. And also, if you want to do a career switch, like we all just uh, shared, it's actually a long journey. So I still suggest like it, it should be highly focused. The second thing at so sort of echoes to Jane's answer. I think the when you do networking, it's not sometimes you go to A and then A introduce to B and then B introduce to C and then you got the right answer, right? But how do this A and B, like the middleman, really want to recommend you? Because they know you, they understand you, they have face interaction with you, they know your reputation, they know your capabilities. So they will have more, like even stronger recommendation or stronger motivation to help you. I think that's also uh, the full-time MBA can help you with your uh, networking intensity. Network intensity, great, uh, and it's it's interesting then that, that obviously focus comes up, and that will definitely be one of the, the themes to take away from uh, from today, I imagine. Uh, one of the, the questions in the in the group is, you know, it is obviously kind of a you know a marathon on the, the sixteen month program. You know, how, how do you how do you kind of maintain that that focus throughout the program? And I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this open to, to the group if any any of the alums wants to, to kind of to jump in on this. Um, so either answer it how you personally stay focused, or indeed how you kind of I guess recharged your batteries, you know, on campus because I guess it's not it's not all lecture, 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 right? That there are kind of uh, the, the social side or the, the side beyond the classroom that gives you that chance to kind of pull back a little bit. But um, does anybody want to jump in on that, or if not, I'm happy to to cold call. Um, maybe maybe I can share a bit um, because there is there's a, there's a lot of. Um, work to be done in the first year or, or, or maybe in the first couple of terms but but it it is very draining and, and, and exhausting and and what this is again very personal um, there's two things that really shaped me um, one was that throughout the MBA I tried to go as much as possible to the gym and work out so so see seeps um, Shanghai campus has great great fitness facilities and that really allowed me to just um, think about anything else that was not um, work hunting or um, workload uh, of classes, cases, and, 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 and anything related to, 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 to the MBA. Um, but then the other thing, which I was not really expecting, but just came and allowed me to connect in a very different way with my classmates was that um at, during the exchange program i was able to get more close to the religious side um as well so that gave me a lot of reflection um that gave me a lot of peace in a very stressful period of time in which you had a lot of uncertainty and that increases your faith after all that you know that ev everything you're doing is right everything you're doing 
um, it's in the right time, in the right place, and you just have to have um, faith that everything will um, turn out to be the way that has to be. And that mm. gave me a lot of just peace of mind, of just being chill and calm and be able to interact with anyone that I spoke to in a very peaceful way. Because people tell, yes, people tell. And now um, on the other side, when I have to recruit an interview, I can tell those that are very anxious and very nervous and, and that they're not really passionate about the job they're interviewing for. They just want the job, um, whatever job it is. Um, and those that actually come um, to an interview and tells you like, hey, you know what? Maybe I'm not the best choice for you. Maybe you should focus on different skills, different experiences. Maybe I'm not the best candidate for you. And they're very chill. They're very um, calm. They have peace in themselves and allows you to have a different type of conversation. Um, so that was my, 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 my takeaway about the MBA. Um, it's not only academics. Um, there's a lot of academics. There's a lot of partying. There's a lot of networking. Um, but there was also a lot of some self-reflection, um, self-discovery self from the religious side and also on the fitness side as well. Sure. Now it's, it's interesting to frame it that way, Pablo, and the but I guess both the spiritual side and also the, the fitness side. It was funny when you mentioned about partying, uh, Jennifer gave it a little bit of a smile. So I think maybe I'm, I'm just going to cold call you now, uh, maybe some uh, reflections from that or uh, how that helped you to kind of to take stock and get through. <laughs> Well, yeah. Uh, uh, well, I, I want to share it. Like, uh, also, we all share about uh, how how career switch is hard and blah blah blah. But MBA is so much fun. Really, these are the, <laughs> probably my my most fun year. And believe me, I had my fun time in college. And I think MBA time was even more fun. <laughs> uh, for the partying, it's a. Uh, uh, it's uh, sometimes it's about networking. Sometimes it's about really just relax, and some sometimes it's really about just you know uh, getting to know more people outside of the industry. Whatever purpose you have, like there are a lot of events that you can go to, and you can open your eyes. Maybe it's not just about the job you see in MBA world. Maybe you can see uh, what the hottest industries in Shanghai uh, right now, and what are the people thinking about. Uh, for the, and how to manage that? Well, it, it, uh, well, yeah. So, so my lifestyle basically, I I, I did my classes during the uh, daytime, and then uh, you know, uh, did, did finish all the homework and then all the assignments, etc. And then you go out party, and then came back at midnight a party, <laughs> and then and then continue to finish my my uh, work or assignments. Um, but I think for me, this eighteen months was amazing. Like it's really uh, fulfilling, or I. I, it's just not really about academic or, or, or study. Uh, it's about really what do you want to achieve in your life and what kinds of people you want to meet and how to make your Shanghai life even more colorful. Mm. That's a really nice way, really nice way to, to, to put it. Um, I, I'm conscious of time. So what I'm going to do is maybe ask the panel to, to share kind of one, one final takeaway. It could be a, a piece of advice for, you know, if they're applying to, to the MBA or about kind of, you know, making the most of your time on, on campus or, you know, indeed maybe just to, to, if not like a summary of, you know, reflections that we've shared today, but uh, anything kind of, you know, top of mind. Uh, maybe Jane, we'll, we'll come to you first. We'll go uh, Jane, Woody, um, Pablo, and then, and then finish back with, uh, with Jennifer. So Jane, over to you. Um, okay. Uh, so I think the first one is, um, like we've all said, actually, all the, all the panelists have said, it's a journey, right? The MBA. So I think that includes the application process, right? The application process it's a journey. So when you start doing the application, you have an idea of what, why you want to do an MBA and maybe why seeds. And then you attend events like this. That helps you formulate, you know, a better understanding of what you could get out of it. So I think, I think and all the other panelists would agree. And I, I think at least I'm, I'm hearing um, nuggets of, of this, of this um, uh, sentiment is that before you actually accept, right, the, the MBA offer, have formulate in your mind what you want to get out of the MBA. Yeah. And I think that brings back to, you know, we said focus. So I think that's the beginning of the focus journey, right? So say, what do you want to, what do I want to achieve out of the MBA? And to hold on to that throughout the MBA, because you will be distracted, absolutely mm -hmm. distracted um, with everything that hits your way. And that's part, part of the plan, right? 
Um, but just put in a diary, write it down somewhere and say, this is what I want to get out of the MBA. And then I think secondly is um, there is quite a strong focus on um, academia and results, et cetera, at school. And I'm sure it's the same at all different MBAs. Um, but I, you know, <laughs> I might get um, uh, sort of a pat on the head for, for saying this, but I think if you did an MBA and all you want, were interested in was just the academics, I think it's cheaper just to buy the books, I think. <laughs> so what I would really truly recommend is to say, make the most of everything else that the MBA offers to you other than the books and the academia. Like, like we've been saying, you know, all afternoon, you know, the networking, the, ex the, 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 the platform to experiment, right? It's a platform to make connections, to make some friends, right? It, these are the lifelong investments. And I hope that every student who does decide to do the MBA, you get that on top, 500% on top of what you've, you've learned just purely from the academic point of view. Very nice, I uh, enjoy that. Thank you, Jane. Uh, Woody, uh, over to you. Final okay, uh, we are doing that is the, the hardest thing and the best thing are always the same. So based on my experience, I think uh, uh, SIPS is uh, it's a great uh, starting point. A turning point for some people who want to switch their career, but it's not an ending. Uh, no matter you do the MD education or not, I think uh, uh, my suggestion is that uh, uh, be brave to move forward and uh, encourage the people around us to do the same until we can become a bad person. Okay. Thank you. Very nice. Again, I guess it's all part of the the journey, right? And it's uh, you know lifelong journey. Uh, Pablo. Thoughts. Um, my my thoughts is is I can find a, a way to sound smart, but actually this is this journey is so personal. Um, it's 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 really about are you willing to invest in, in you? Uh, do you know what you want? And if you don't know what you want, it's fine. It's fine because most of my um, classmates and friends um, didn't really know what 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 they wanted. So I think overall, it's it's being humble. Um, admit that you don't know many things. Admit that you don't have everything sorted out. Just be humble and open to listen to different perspectives, different opinions, which for me was was key. Um, before before going to to China to Shanghai, I was I was based in 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 Dublin in in Europe. I had a different perspective of life. I had a different perspective of business. Um, and when I got to Shanghai, I, I just knew that I had to be be quiet and and listen, just listen and 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 understand what everyone, uh, where everyone was coming from, um, and, and and truly be open. Um, and not debate to win, but debate to exchange. I, I think it's it, it was such a fruitful um, journey when I was in Shanghai at, um, with CIBS. I learned so much. Um, for me, it was not business school. It was, it was more like getting involved with the culture, um, having lunch with, with my local classmates. Um, even though they might have spoken in Mandarin, I did not care. Um, I was able to pick up a little bit of the language. I was able to understand a little bit of the social cues, which for me now gets me into a completely different advantage, um, even in my professional life. So it, it's, it's a journey just to be humble. Um, that, that for me was my, my big takeaway, um, which ultimately leads you to learn, to experience, to network, to make friends, to make um, great, great classmates and, and lifetime friends. Thank you, Pablo. Uh, very, very nice. And, and last but not least, uh, Jennifer, if we could come to you, final closing thoughts. Uh, I love all the uh, panel advice from uh, three alumni. Uh, I totally, fully agree with that. I have the same feelings. Um, just one thing I, I would like to add is uh, also, I think MBA for me is understanding more stories worldwide and understand my own life priorities. Shanghai, is well, uh, not considering the COVID uh, situation right now, but is the most international cities, uh, one of the most international cities worldwide. Here, not just MBA, you meet so many kinds of people worldwide hearing their stories. Uh, and also then let me rethink about what, a, 
what about my life? What about what kinds of priorities or what kind of person I want to be? So not just about job, I totally agree. It's really about uh, making you to a different person and have uh, different views of what you really think about. Maybe you used to think that, but now I changed. Like Jing, I actually, I think I, I changed a lot during my MBA journey about my life, about my job, about the people I care, uh, about the next five years, what I want to want to do. Um, the, the, that's my uh, final thoughts. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, I mean, that's uh, that's that's fantastic, and I think we have maybe four potential seeds professors in the in the future uh, sharing uh, sharing here today. So that's really great to really great to to see and to hear. Uh, I'm also very grateful for everybody that's joined us on on Zoom, on YouTube, on on Reach Out, on the other channels we have. We've been really blown away by the the response. Uh, so thank you for spending uh, part of your Sunday with us. Um, if you're interested in next steps of, uh, of coming to, to campus and exploring the, the, the MBA, uh, then me and my colleagues will be in touch in the, in the, in the coming weeks. Um, if you came to campus, obviously we give you a tour, we give you a brochure, the kind of, you know, the alumni magazine. Uh, so my colleagues will be in touch and we can actually kind of send uh, those to you or arrange for you to kind of come in and have a, you know, have a, have a visit if it's safe for you to, to travel uh, here or if you're already in, uh, in Shanghai. Um, so thank you very much. And um, I hope everybody stays safe and enjoy the rest of their Sunday. Hopefully it's been a valuable session for, for everybody. Um, and yeah, thank you again to the wonderful alumni panel. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all, uh, audience and alumni alike, and Professor Jang on campus again soon. Uh, take care and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.